just tell us when code we're good we're live we are live we are live oh man this is kind of a little different <laughs> different youtube scene for us that's for sure yeah. uh yeah today guys we're doing something a little different because we are practicing um what is it called self-containment right isn't that it uh social distancing social shelter distancing. in place you shelter, know something like that um so we're, this is going to be kind of uh, you'll see this more than once in the next couple of weeks or hopefully we'll see how long this uh, this whole thing lasts but today we have a super super special guest got an email a couple of days ago from a uh, guy named Patrick and he says hey Trent I am a uh, critical care physician in Boise and um, anyway I would just like to kind of bring some light to you guys on what's going on through all this and and anyway Patrick you're right up in the top right corner for me. This is all weird for us too. So, <laughs> but um, anyway, thank you so much for joining us on on YouTube and um, just to kind of bring some light to this. So, what we're going to do, guys, the format that we're going to go for is is we're going to have questions that you guys can actually ring in. We're going to start out with some basic stuff about the coronavirus, and and Patrick is going to kind of walk us through quite a bit of that, and then and then we're going to field some questions as well at the end. So, um, Patrick, yeah. Thanks for joining us, brother. Totally, totally. Give Absolutely. us a little background. Give us some of your background first, and um, and then let's just go from there. Yeah, I'm from Minnesota. Grew up whitetail hunting. Been out here in the Pacific Northwest for about 20 years. Been here in Idaho for 10 years. Um, when I'm not busy doing my doctor stuff, I try to just be outside, get outside, get out the foothills, get out the mountains, and um, so and. and help people when I can um, and, you know, try to make the right decisions, whether it's uh, at work or out in the field. <laughs> Copy. So um, what inspired your email to me for this, uh, for, for, for your email that you sent to me, what kind of inspired that and what, what made you, what made you do that? Yeah, I think um, I had one, I had to unplug from the regular news and I was, um, uh, just from, you know, at some point you, you, it's kind of information overload. Um, I still listen to, you know, people's podcasts and, and I think our generation, some people don't even watch TV news anymore. Our, our information is our, our YouTube channels, our podcasts. And um, I think, um, you know, there's a, as hunters and young people, we kind of consider ourselves bulletproof um, and Hey, if, well, we're, we're sore today. We can still make it up the mountain, but you know, um, there, there's, there's, there's the chance for young people to die from this as well. I think while we worry about people with underlying health diseases, elderly people, there are, you know, last week in our hospital of the people that were in over half of them were under the age of 55. Now those people weren't critically ill, but you still had young people in the hospital. And, um, you know, my dad's 80. He still comes out here and does things with me in the mountains. I still go back each year and go hunting with him, but there, there's, there's a chance some of us could lose a hunting partner this year. And I'm, I'm not trying to be an alarmist at all. I think our country will get through this. We will get through this. But I think, um, you know, if there's um, people that had had to tune out some of the other noise, but want information, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to help get that message out or answer questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. The, the biggest thing is, you know, we're trying to as born and raised, you know, everything here is hunting, fishing, trying to see what kind of effects this disease has, um, you know, for us right now, what it's going to be like in six months. Um, and I'm kind of excited just to kind of hear your input, because like you said, the noise uh, broadcasted through news, social media, rumor mill, whatever that is, um, there's definitely been a mixed, mixed report. So I think it's great for to have you on here and kind of to to learn from your experience where you're actually dealing with patients uh, with yeah. virus so yeah so what is so uh, walk us through it just a little bit as far as what precautions should we be taking right now from what you've seen and um just in, just in the last what two weeks probably three weeks maybe yeah i think i mean People probably know the, the wash your hands, the if you have a fever, you got to like figure out where you're around someone sick, all this, all that general information that's out there. Um, I think the other, the really important thing that's sort of the reality is you got to stay in touch with your local health department on their website or their state or your state department or your state 
um, health department of where they're seeing, quote, community spread, because community spread is where it's no longer getting imported from someone who traveled there. Um, it's now just in the community, just like when we see other infections go through. Um, and, and that's where the, the, the virus can really spread quickly. And that's where hospitals get worried about like this surge of just a massive amount of patients. And, and so understanding if that's going on, or if you were in a, in a, in a city that two weeks ago, you were there just seeing family and also now it's, 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 it's popped up there as a hotspot. You want to kind of understand that just so you can kind of check yourself, make sure you're not having symptoms, um, making, you know, these things, uh, fever, body aches, cough, um, that, so that you can kind of protect both yourself and your family. Cause if you protect yourself and your family, you're going to be able to protect the rest of the community and help stop the spread. Gotcha. Yeah. You were talking before, uh, before we went live here and, uh, you were saying some stuff and it, it kind of reminded me of kind of like a Jenga game, right? Where the, the tower of the Jenga game is all together and it's, it's the healthcare system. It's working great. It's the firefighters, it's the first responders, it's the, you know, everything goes about it. And as soon as you start pulling those those key pieces out and may, you know, and, and poking holes in this whole system, yeah. like you were saying before, we're not going to have the resources. Like, like, like you said, as far as, you know, ask a firefighter or whatnot, Hey, is there anything I can do for you? Can I cook you guys a meal? Can I, these are, these are small ways that, that we can help. Right. But they could probably prove big in the, in the long run. Absolutely. And it's just things you don't even think of. Um, I think every community has to get a little creative. There's not going to be a, a one, a one, a cookie cutter thing for the whole nation because we are different communities, different people, areas where it's very compact versus where it's spread out. Um, but yeah, you know, how can, you know, I never thought that the restaurant industry was going to save the United States. I'm not saying that's the case right now, but keeping restaurants going so that people can at least do takeout food or, or that they can to give some food to a fire station or whatever it is to keep that part of the economy going, it's actually really important. So um, there's all these little things that it's just a different mindset or mind shift of how we think about it. But yeah, especially people that are in the front line, um, like we were talking about before, I mean, it doesn't, you know, no job at a hospital or a clinic is too small right now. If a clinic from a medical standpoint is kind of shut down, we're trying to, at our system, we're trying to repurpose those people into something else that they can do at the hospital or something else at another clinic, different ways of doing phone calls for patients to try to keep people in their jobs or try to keep them doing stuff because it is, this is a, I mean, there's no one who's not been affected by this. And I just, my heart goes out to people that have their job, they've had to stand down from their job or they're temporarily, it is so, it, it is tough, but but back to your question, I mean, if you know someone that works at a hospital, whether they're the, the janitor, the nurse, the respiratory therapist, whoever it is, helping them stay safe, helping their family keep going, they're going to be able to help stomp this out so the rest of us then can get back to life. Can you, can you kind of walk through uh, the Ketchum scenario and what you were talking about, what you've dealt with so far, just directly? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know all the details from just how it probably started there, but knowing Ketchum like other resort towns, it was likely, you know, travel, just, I mean, that's how this virus has made its way around the world. And um, when, and it, but it started to affect, it wasn't that the staff at the hospital got exposed in the hospital so much. It was that um, just because of the community spread also, and this is a little hospital. I mean, they don't even have an ICU. And also they had a bunch of employees out and they had to, you know, close the inpatient side, move patients down to the other hospital and, and they're just a freestanding ER. And, and that's what you worry about of a surge in a community or a surge at a hospital while all of a sudden they're overwhelmed and then, and then they're just stuck because you don't want to send sick people to, I mean, sick workers to the hospital because you got to keep the hospital clean. You know, you, you can't, you, God forbid, you don't want someone accidentally spreading this to a, a ward of just regular patients who are there for something else, you know? So it, you have to be, there's an over abundance of caution, but if, if you don't, all of a sudden there's this domino effect and also, and you know, all of a sudden there's a, a hub of your community, a hospital that also can't provide the services. So, and it can happen in a hurry. So what, so uh, 
walk me through the steps of, okay, I woke up this morning and I have a sore throat. So walk me through those steps of maybe, maybe it's symptomatic. I don't know uh, where to go with this question, but kind of walk me through the steps of what to do. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's related to other cold viruses, but this one came from bats of all animals. Um, that's why we call it novel because it wasn't previously in humans. And, and so people are going to, they may have a sore throat or some sinus stuff that's actually in the data that we know from other international studies that that's actually less than 15% of the time. It's fevers, what we call malaise or just it's intense fatigue where you just feel like you just are getting steamrolled by something and maybe you don't have a fever, but you have those shaking chills and then cough. Those would be the mainstay of symptoms because it's actually a deep chest infection, chest cold that turns into pneumonia. So a viral pneumonia. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of people though, they may just feel really run down for a couple of days and a little bit of a cough. And a few days later, they're, they're fine. I mean, I, I totally agree with the information that's out there from the CDC that, you know, 80% of people have mild to moderate symptoms. And in medicine, when we say that, that means you don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to go for special treatment. If you just ride it out, let the virus run its course, you're going to be just fine. Um, but in 20% of people, they're going to need to be seen in the ER because they have difficulty breathing and a proportion of those will have to be admitted to the hospital. Um, and then of those patients in the hospital, it can run anything from you just need some IV fluids and some oxygen for a few days to where the virus takes over your lungs and you go into what we call respiratory failure where you're in the ICU on a ventilator, which is a mechanical machine breathing for you. So, um, and that's a problem, it's a virus, so there's not like uh, antibiotic for it that's gonna kill it. You know, viruses have to run their course. Um, and so it's supportive care, but, um, but that's why we talk about this quarantine period. So when someone has symptoms, so if you wake up with, hey, I got a cough, I got a fever today, man, you gotta sort of think about where you were at, isolate within your house, and there's things online to, to kind of walk people through how to do that. The CDC has excellent information about, hey, if you're just the average family at home and someone gets this, how do you help isolate someone in your own house for a few days while they're either getting testing or whatnot? Um, it, it, you'd wanna reach out to your, your the other important uh, message, I think, understand how your local clinics and your local communities doing testing, because that has just been everywhere. And in one place you can get testing where it's turned around in one day, there's other places where you have to wait a couple of days for a test and you have to wait five more days before you get the result. So understanding that and educating yourself of what's going on in my community, how can I be tested? How can my family member be tested? It? And guys, it's changing daily. So that's something I think anyone can do is figure out how they're being tested. So um, when, when they are tested, when they do get sick, they can call their doctor's office. Their doctor may not want them to come in. They may say, we want you to go to a testing station. Or they may say, no, our clinic is taking people with symptoms. We want you to come in. So that communication is important. What we don't want is someone walking into a clinic without a mask on, <laughs> and all of a sudden coughing, and that's happened, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and so I think, but really for, for just the reality of Jill Public and Jill Public, it is understand how I can locally get tested so that, so that I can figure it out if I have it or not, and, and, or figure out if a family member has it or not. Are they coming out with a lot more of those tests? Is that going to be uh, uh, sooner than later, hopefully, uh, a thing that they're, because like right now, right, there's the tests are the hardest thing to find, right? There's a lot of things that are hard to find, including the protective equipment. But yeah, the tests, because knowledge is power. And if you don't know who has it, then you can't figure out if something is a hot spot or you can't, you, you know, because some people, their test is negative and they got right. the flu and they have something else. And you can say, you know, you're not going to, spread this to a bunch of other people. So um, the t we, I don't know that, I don't have any inside intel on when things are gonna come online. Um, it, I think over the next month, if I look at the reality of this, is a lot of times hindsight's 2020 in these medical things and these public health things is where were we a month ago and where are we now? And I think hopefully if I look at where we were a month ago where we were ground zero, no tests to where we are now, I would hope a month from now, it would be more real time where most people can get a test and get that result in 24, 48 hours. Do not hold me to that. Um, it's gonna be unrealistic though to say, oh, in two weeks, 
the whole United States is going to get real time testing, same day testing that we're, we're not there yet. Wow. Gotcha. Um, let's jump a couple uh, questions here on the YouTube front um, and we'll kind of intermix some. I'm going you know, to Trent's got some questions himself some more here. Uh, first one here, Caleb Franzoy says, is there any long term effects of the virus? Yes, that's a great question that we don't know. I, I would typically say for someone who gets the virus, recovers from the illness, and is not hospitalized, that they're going to do completely fine. Um, the, the patients we worry about are um, in these respiratory illnesses are people who wind up critically ill in a ventilator, and they're on the ventilator for two to four weeks before their lungs heal, before they can get up and walk again, and then their body's so deconditioned. So there are patients that have long-term effects if you end up on a ventilator. Um, if you don't end up on a ventilator or you don't have to go to the hospital, I, I, I would suspect you're going to do just fine. Gotcha. Uh, another one here is the, the virus effect on children. So far, have you seen any cases of people under the age of 18 in, in Boise there? Yeah, so I actually, I, I, I don't know that. So I'm an adult critical care doctor. Um, okay. and I haven't in the last week spoken to any of my pediatric colleagues. And so I don't actually know the incidence of that. If, if we look at the, the World Health Organization data, which is very accurate, transparent, not, not always accurate, because if you don't test someone, you don't know, but very transparent in the way they collect data. It's a, it's a reliable source. In China, um, kids didn't die from this. You know, I, I think we can safely say that unless, and the kids that did die, they probably had some underlying severe condition, you know, congenital heart defect, congenital kidney defect, something, you know, catastrophic like this. What we don't really know, and I, what, I, what I shouldn't comment is, I don't know how it circulates through the kids as, as carriers. We know that kids actually fight off this virus um, pretty well. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not transmitting it to other people. And I don't think we totally understand the, the science and the epidemiology of that. Gotcha. Um, but, if my another... kid got, but if my kid got sick, guys, you know, you'd take care of them. But I would, I would if they're under age 18, I, I do not. I, I think we right now we are not seeing little kids die from this, you know. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Doug McCoy asks, is, does vinegar kill the virus on service, surfaces or what's the best home, de uh, you know, I mean. Vinegar, I, that one I don't know. Um, uh, so a dilute bleach solution is always good. Um, and it doesn't have to be, and actually if you go to the CDC website, again, this is, this is sort of good gospel stuff, so to speak. They have a list of, and they also have links to approved things that are known to be what we call viral cytos, so that they kill that they kill or disintegrate the virus. So I actually don't know about vinegar. Gotcha. Um, and then another um, Pascal Cordier says, uh, has the coronavirus situation affected our hunting plans for this spring? Trent, you wanna? Uh, oh, and that's that, that's not intended for Patrick. Apparently, that's intended for us. Um, Man, yeah, it has. I mean, we have bear hunts that are already in limbo. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. I'm sure there's going to be some cancellations going on there. Um, a lot of the fishing stuff that we've been planning on doing right now, and that would be a great question, I think, for, for Dr. Patrick as far as, like, are we okay? Like, since we've been self-quarantined for so long, we don't show any symptoms. Is it okay to go fishing with your brother or... or uh, yeah, I think, I mean, every, every state's going to put out some local ordinances and so you have to like check in on what they're saying. But yeah, if, if you've been self-quarantined and haven't been around sick people for two weeks and the person that you're going with, it can say, safely say the same thing, you two out in a boat uh, it, or walk in the shore, throwing, you know, uh, throwing a spay line, you're going to be fine. You know? Okay. So now would I get on a charter boat with 15 people in a closed cabin? Gotcha. Probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. So just being smart there. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's one that we've actually like to uh, just trying to figure out ourselves because for one, the social uh, acceptance of us, if we go out and make content right now and we're Trent and I are together and Trevor and we're in, in a boat and we're under shelter in place order in the state, is that something do you, 
as a physician, do you see that as a, an appropriate thing to be putting out there in a message or is that something that we should shy away from? Um, Easy on this answer now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. think, I, I don't know the Oregon rules. I think two guys should still be able to go fishing. Um, I think having a big backyard barbecue with 20 people, I think that's what's hard for families right now, but that's the sort of stuff that's going to get us in trouble, unfortunately. Gotcha. Um, and so, but yeah, I mean, go scout your elk country, go shed hunting with your buddy, go, uh, go float a river out in the open. It's the, it's the close contact with larger groups of people is how it's, things spread. It's just being cognizant of what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. And, and uh, being honest with yourself. Hey, my, my spouse um, had to travel for business last week and they just got back from this area where they're seeing a ton of cases. We, we got to lay low for a while, you know, uh, you know, until we see that maybe she, that, that he or she doesn't have symptoms. It's those sort of things that I think are just a huge change in life. But if we're honest with each other about it and our friends and family, you're going to keep each other safe and then you're going to be able to go out and do those things in small groups. Yeah, no, that's just it. it I just want to throw a big announcement out there. Uh, big A, Austin, my brother, throat punch 34. He's coming home from Texas. We haven't seen him in a long, long time. So he has loaded up the truck and he says he's coming home. But like you just said, he's going to, they have a lake property and they're going to quarantine for two weeks at their property at the lake before we get to see in the, you know, any of the uh, nieces and nephews and all that. And so anyway, but, uh, but yeah, it's a pretty cool time right now for we're excited to see them at some point. So go ahead with uh, the questions, Cody. Yeah, it looks like there's quite a few questions on ibuprofen. Um, and it's uh, Chase and Tails. Yep. He's asking, what medications can you take to break the fever? Some people are saying not to take ibuprofen. Um, and another one is, uh, which uh, anti implant should be taken besides Tylenol? Well, so I think Tylenol is safe. You just have to remember that um, got to be cautious with Tylenol with other painkillers. So there's some things that like Norco or Percocet, they actually have a painkiller with Tylenol in it. So as long as you know what your body is taking in for total dose of Tylenol, Tylenol probably should be first line. Um, I don't think we know the answer on the ibuprofen. There was this kind of signal that came out in a couple of medical studies of maybe people having worse outcomes with their respiratory disease if they were taking ibuprofen. Um, and it's, it's something I think to be cognizant of. I, I, I don't think we know yet. Um, so I, I actually, I gotta be honest with this, I don't know on that one because I don't think the medical community as a whole has a, has a carte blanche recommendation. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, everything's happened so rapidly trying to get you know, studies done at the same time information out there is probably the biggest challenge I would imagine. Yeah. Because right now nothing's done in a controlled fashion. Like you'd normally test a drug and give it to some some people and not another. Everything's just all this observational data that's coming out. So, gotcha. Um, Curtis uh, asks: Is it true warm weather areas are less likely to have larger quantities of people getting the virus? Yeah, we don't know that. Um, there, there's seasonality to, to. There's a lot of theories of why we even have seasonality with things like flu, and we just do not know what this virus is going to do with different seasons. So, um, I mean, for instance, when it was started its outbreak three months ago, they got cases down in Australia who it was, it was warm there then. So, um, I, we, we don't know, I would not count on the sun coming out in May and June, burning this thing up. Now, does it, a lot of, we got a lot of questions of the, the virus can, it, how long does it live on surfaces and stuff? Yeah, so I think the, the studies we have where it's been, so there's two things about viruses. So not to get too geeky, but viruses are just genes, so DNA wrapped in protein. So when they test for a virus, sometimes it's like a CSI investigator where they're just swabbing it and they're seeing if that viral DNA is there. Just because it was there doesn't mean it was still infective, okay? So um, we know that for sure four hours on a, uh, there's been studies that show for sure viable virus for four hours on a dry surface, meaning like a tabletop. Um, beyond that, we're still learning about it. Um, you can definitely detect virus um, a day or two later, but again, is that just the, the remnants of the virus or is it actually virus you could still get infected with? 
Um, when you're at work or you're at an unknown kind of area, you got to assume like, hey, someone else could have just been here. I got to wipe it down. You know, at home, if no one else is sick, I mean, general, just clean your house. You're going to be fine. You don't have to wash your hands in alcohol 10 times a day at home if it's just you at home. <laughs> We're doing that anyway. My wife's pretty. Yeah, we've got Lysol coming in and out of this doorknob. Going, it's 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 nuts around here. Yeah. If we had enough, we'd spray down my whole drift boat. I'm sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> what else do we got for questions? Um, it, Sandy Booth asked, "Is the uh, virus growing, or is it being contained and killed?" Yeah. So I'd, I'd say the the I'd use the term is it spreading or not, and I think it's definitely spreading. Um, it, we know that in China, they the, when they finally shut it down, they didn't report cases for a while. Now they're letting people come back to China. You guys kind of asked before, hey, what are we going to do when we start to go back to normal life? And now they're worried about people coming back to China or traveling to China, and it could burn through again because there's still a lot of people in China that hasn't been exposed to the virus. Um, so I, I would say it is still spreading and it's still growing. I mean, every day. Um, if you look at things like, if you go to Johns Hopkins, they have like this, like this massive global map and it gives you all the data of where all the cases are on the count. I mean, it's going up each day. Um, so um, we, and, and also with the testing, because we don't have all the data on testing yet, it's hard for us to predict just how, how, how frequent or prevalent it is in certain communities. So I would say at this point, it's still spreading. And it's still spreading in Italy. I mean, Italy is, Italy is a tragedy right now. My, my heart's just go out to, to anyone who's there or knows anyone from there. It's just a real tragedy. Copy. Uh, um, here's a couple more, just directly more on the, on the hunting and fishing side of life. Um, if hunting closures, if, hunt, if hunting experiences closures, what will the long-term effects be on our wildlife as far as spring seasons, if they get shut down or turkeys? Um, you guys have any thoughts or there? Yeah, I, I think, well, I think what we're right now, everybody, and we, we talked about the economical uh, wake of this afterwards a little bit before this, before we got on the thing. And, and that's the big thing, I think, for a lot of people right now. Like, let's say, you know, they just lost their job, you know, for so many weeks and stuff like that. I think, I think that's going to have some effect on the hunting thing as far as pleading for tags and trying to draw some tags and stuff like that if it if they haven't already applied for them um kind of less spending if you will you know on, on that side of things um but i think as sports when i think honestly we're i don't know i i, I want to say i want to think like we're more a little bit more uh live off the land you know kind of people i guess and and uh like right now we're all grinning from year to year if we have an elk in our freezer right so it's uh, it's one of those things where where we usually find a way, I think, and um, without going outside our bounds, right, um, legally, of course. But um, but yeah, it's going to be really really interesting what happens as far as you know taking time off this next year to go hunting, where it, you know you haven't worked possibly for a month and a half, or I, I don't know, you know, it, it could be it could definitely you might not see a soul this year out in the woods i have no idea how that's gonna even if we can get out in the woods this year you, you don't know i guess the length of this so there's so many unknowns i think that it's like it's so interesting just to uh, man see how fast how fast that things can shut down yeah Tr trevor and i had a pretty long conversation last night and again this morning and it it was about the depending on the segment uh, segregation of the population that people, some people feel that they're affected, some people don't. And like the case where Trevor as a dentist, he's state mandated to shut down until June 15th. And it's as much the, the low uh, supply of PPE, I think. And, and also the, the, you know, that case of using dental tools and someone had the virus, it could get spread at a pretty uh, rapid rate, but, so it's very real to him as to what's going on and someone that's not as affected and their job, you know, job hasn't been affected or any of those changes. Um, and I, it's kind of different to see how that population's dealing with it and kind of maybe blowing this off a little bit or being over the top uh, cautious on it. Um, it's, it's just an interesting time to kind of see 
you know, if you take that picture from above of, of how people take on this. Yeah, that, it, that kind of rings into the next question. Uh, John L. It says, Gun, guns and ammo shelves are all empty. What do we think of this? It was the same way in the election, you know, the last election. Everybody bought up all their guns. And I mean, I think that's kind of the first go-to for everybody when, when, when something out of the ordinary hits, you know, everybody goes to the, to the gun shelves, which is probably not always right. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think we've seen the, I think the, the rocks hit the pond, but I honestly think the, the ripple effect on this is going to be way greater than. Yeah. You might have more to add to that. Uh, I would say if this is a baseball game, we probably just took batting practice or maybe the top of the first inning. Okay. Yeah. Batting practice, rocks hitting ponds. Cody, you got any analogies? Uh, not, not, not good on the analogies here. No. Um, I think the one thing, I, and I've got a call in to, to one of the guys I know that's a district biologist for the fishing side here, just to kind of understand if there's any state mandates um, a friend of mine, James Nash, who we're uh, scheduled to go bear hunting with, he is a licensed outfitter and he did get a, an email from the state marine board stating that guiding from as a director from Cape Brown is, is currently closed uh, statewide with a shelter in place order. Um, so we're trying to understand, um, you know, can we go out legally, even uh, like the local boat ramp here, I drove down to it today and it says ramp closed. You can mm. drive down the river three miles, the next ramp and it was open. So it's like, there's trying to understand the information that there's not really a good source right now as to what we can or can't do under the shelter in place order. I think it's a, the biggest challenge for us. But it's crazy. I mean, it's spring right now. And so, I mean, I, I'm not a bear hunter, but are there going to be twice as many bears next year if guys aren't on hunting? Um, what, what if this happens? What if it trickles into the fall or whatever, God forbid, and are they only going to have elk walking in their backyard because there's twice as many elk? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question of what, you know, there's this delicate balance of our, our, our wildlife populations and the interface with urban areas. And, and is that going to change from this? I think it's a, it's a, I, I have no idea. It'd be really interesting to get a biologist, uh, wildlife biologist input on that. Yeah. 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 That's, I think the hardest part is there's so much unknown right now, just because what has changed in a week versus two weeks ago. Um, it's, it's so rapid, um, makes it challenging and frustrating at the same time. Right. Cause it just, you don't know. Yeah. 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 So guys, we got a few more minutes on here. Uh, if you're just coming into this whole thing on YouTube, we're doing questions live, question and answers for uh, Dr. Patrick here on the coronavirus. If you have any questions for him, feel free to write them down over in the comment section and, and we'll try to answer them. Um, Cody, any anything that uh, that you've got? Yeah. So you know, about this kind of, and you covered it a little bit about the re resurgence of this virus, you know, like, uh, do you feel like there's potential, you know, say we, we were state mandated through the 28th of April right now, schools are shut down, they open back up May 1, if, in, if that actually happens, is this somewhat just preventing the inevitable that the spread is going to be uh, pretty high? Or do you feel like with this flattened, the slow of the curve, um, yeah, what are your thoughts there? Um, I don't know. Um, I think if we didn't flat, I think we are flattening the curve by measures that were put in place. And if we didn't do that, we'd be having an Italy event and that's what we have to avoid. Um, and, um, I, I, and I hope that we can start to turn back uh, the restrictions in areas where it's not too hot. Um, and yeah, people are still going to get sick. It's still going to, you know, uh, go smolder through a community. Hopefully we just don't want the big burn where the whole town's on fire. And so I, I, I understand your question. Is it inevitable? Um, the other thing is that um, there is going to be some herd immunity. So as a community gets exposed, 
people that have been exposed, they're not going to, right now we have no reinfection rate in China. So of people that, I mean, there was 80,000 people um, minimum uh, infected in China. That's just what we know about. And they're reporting no people getting the disease a second time. So in kind of public health, the way we think about that is then you're to get some herd immunity, meaning, well, you get a critical mass of people that are immune to it, then it can't spread through as much. So that's something that we hope this virus doesn't mutate. And so that if we, one, prevent the surge at hospitals and, and kind of suppress this epidemiologic spike um, and give time for people to get some herd immunity. But I, I think you're right. I think it's some of this is I don't inevitable that everyone's going to get it and we're going to it's an existential threat to the U.S. But it, it is going to smolder through uh, here and there for sure in different communities. Um, but but by suppressing things a little bit up front, like if New York over the next six weeks would calm down, then we know that, hey, we don't got to get supplies in New York. If somewhere else flares, we can get supplies there, you know. And so there, there's just there's like this just global supply chain shortage that is just um, that is just makes it really, really complicated. And that's what I've kind of noticed from what you've said and everything. If anything else, what doing uh, the hold in place part, our part is is buying us time pretty much to get those supplies for if the the worst of the worst happens, correct? Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's these little things we were talking about before offline, before we went live of like, you know, if you know someone that works at a hospital, if you know a fireman, if you know uh, a first responder paramedic, helping them out so they can stay healthy, they're going to help beat the virus. If they help beat the virus, then we're all going to be able to go back to our life sooner and we can turn back on the faucet of the economy and people's jobs and people's darn lives because there's there's no one who hasn't been affected by this, you know, yeah. whether it's their job, psychologically, medically, socially, it, it is just, uh, you know, our, our life is different. It's going to be different. But um, like you said before, I think um, we just live in an amazing country. And while there's uncertain times, we will get through this. We will help each other. It's going to be rough, but things will get better. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's so, do a couple more, Code. Yeah, well, I had another question here just, um, and, and we, and I know this is somewhat unknown, but has there been any talks of somewhat of a, like a flu season type? So this next fall, this virus lives through the summers, goes somewhat dormant in the, the spread. They see possible resurgence um, later on October, November when the flu virus, has there been any relation to that? I don't think we know that yet. I think the one thing I can say, and I hardly have any influenza in my ICU right now because everyone's doing this coronavirus stuff and we're not seeing regular pneumonia and we're not seeing some of these other respiratory illnesses. So there's a lot of things that'll, that'll, that'll slow down, but yeah, I don't think we, we don't, we don't know that yet, but things will get better. Um, don't, don't, I don't want people to hang their heads. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer on here. It, it just, as you guys have pointed out, there's just a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. and, and hindsight's going to be 2020. We don't always have to make the right decision in the next couple months. We just don't want to make the wrong one, you know, and we're going to learn from this. We're going to get, we're going to, we're going to protect people. We're going to help treat people. And, um, and, you know, still, I, I mean, yeah, check your local regulations, but man, get out there and fish, get out there and go shed hunt, get out there, take care of yourself so you can like unplug from some of this and do some healthy stuff. Um, and then just, you know, watch out for those people in your family that are at risk and, and, and support them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't want to take this too long and be too repetitive guys. Um, I, Cody, you about ready to wrap this up? I can, I can, you want to take yeah. it? Patrick? I think you said it pretty much the best as far as just be smart, be smart about the whole thing. Don't go on, you know, maybe go shed horn hunt with your buddy or something like that and keep a distance. Don't go on the charter boat. And you know what I mean? So I, I think it's just us being smart about it as a, a, as a community. And, and we have no idea about the hunting side of things. We have no, I mean, there's a lot of things that are just still up in the air. I think that we can't really say this is what's going to happen. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot with the virus as well, correct? I mean, longevity and everything, we have no idea. Yeah. We gotta stay yeah. yeah, there was one here. Is there any risk of a virus transferring uh, to a person from a game animal within the U.S.? Have you heard of any? Um, 
Well, not this virus. Um, I actually don't know that. I mean, we, we can see things like brucellosis um, that are like in Buffalo. Um, and, but of a virus, there's this thing that's related to chronic wasting disease called a prion. That's not a virus. Um, that's what was the, the, the whole outbreak in, in England a few, a couple of decades ago. It's related to chronic wasting disease, but yeah, I think as hunters, I, I used to never wear gloves. I grew up digging in barehanded. Um, but, and even as, after I completed medical school, I was still doing that in the last 10 years. I glove up now. I think there are things that, you know, animal herds are mixing more with other domestic herds, all this sort of stuff. And there's some things we don't know. But I don't know of a particular virus uh, in particular that, 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 that I know of. Uh, just this one last comment here from Barry Alley. Uh, he said, flattening the curve will only slow the spread, but will allow for medical care for all. Is that something you agree with in that statement? Um, yeah, you know, that, that gets to a little touchy subject of what we were talking on before we went online of my biggest fear as a provider that like, we know how to take care of people. We know how to be safe at the hospital. We know how to protect ourselves so we can take care of our patients. Um, if there's, if, if you have an Italy event, all of a sudden we, we maybe can't provide care to everyone. And that's, that's what has us concerned as healthcare providers that, I mean, it's my job to help take care of people when they're sick. And if I know what I need to do, but I don't have the tools to do it, th th then that's a missed opportunity, you know? And so I, I agree with that comment that, that flattening the curve will, We'll make sure that if someone is sick, we can take care of them. Um, that, so that, that's, a, that's an accurate statement. Well, cool guys. Well, that, oh man. Yeah, that was, I'm so glad that you reached out and this has been actually pretty fun and very informative for me too, as far as that goes. And I'm hoping a lot of people got something out of it. Uh, guys, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing these more often because we are locked in place or I always get that wrong. I don't know what, what is it called again? Goody? <laughs> shelter, yeah. shelter we're sheltered place. down. We're sheltered down. So um, anyway, we're going to, we're going to do some more of these guys. And we'll have other people on uh, in the comments, say who you would like to have. We're talking maybe having Dirk on and having some, you know, doing some fun stuff too. So at night in the evenings or during the day that you guys can get on here and kind of maybe unplug from it just a little bit and, and get some entertainment out of, and maybe some learning of elk hunting or whatever from somebody else other than us. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patrick. We really, really appreciate it, man. We really, really do. Oh man, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for keeping it positive and thanks for your guys' educating people, it's important. Absolutely, and uh, to end it off guys, hey, anybody, first responders, uh, doctors, everybody knows someone, everybody knows someone in the medical field, even if it's just a text message, just say, hey, we really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. I mean, any, anything like that goes a long ways because it is some it is some bad times and those guys are working their butts off. So anyway, if you could reach out to them, uh, that would be that would be awesome and, and maybe help them help them along too. So Cody, anything else, buddy? Yeah, no, I think uh, the, the biggest thing here, this was a good test for us tonight to, uh, to, to stream live, go through this process. Like I said, it's a new uncharted territory for us as well on the technical side. So appreciate, uh, Patrick, your time for, for sitting down and too for everyone jumping in here and uh, asking questions, being a part of the chat. And like uh, I said, hopefully once we, we get this uh, uh, kind of bugs worked out and uh, we'll, we'll try to get this on a regular basis here while we're going through this shelter in place order and and to bring as much content as we can. I do know one thing that we've been working on um, the baby bird that footage from Land of the Free One is live. It is found working on an edit right now so that will be up uh, later this week so we can uh, actually see what happened and what went down with Trevor's bull from Land of the Free One. So pretty excited to bring that with you guys. Sweet. We talked about it, but it, it's happening this week. So um, I think with that, um, Patrick, I'll let you close out here. Um, uh, we will get through this, all right? And just um, stay positive, stay educated about what's going on in your community, how to get tested. If you protect yourself and your family, you're going to keep your safe. You're going to keep the community more safe. And we'll all get back to life sooner. 
Um, and, and just, and when you have questions, reach out to your local doctor, your local clinic so that they can help you navigate it. Um, if questions come up, cause that, that's our job as uh, docs. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick. And, um, heck, we're going to keep in touch cause we might have you back actually. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. This was awesome. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. All right, guys, we'll see you. See you.